uh, respected chairpersons and my dear friends. I have been asked to speak on VSD closure complications. And in the interest of time, I'm going to restrict myself only to perimembranous VSD closure and maybe uh, show you a concluding case of a complication in a muscular VSD. Uh, the emphasis of my talk is going to be on preventing complications. So there are basically three things if you do religiously, maybe uh, you will be able to prevent most of the complications. Appropriate patient selection, appropriate device selection, and appropriate execution of the technique. As far as patient selection is concerned, of course you need to close it only if there is an indication for closure. We have been relatively conservative and closing uh, VSDs in patients who are more than 10 kgs because of the reports that complications increase with reduction in age, weight, and body surface area. We have not been venturing in closing perimembranous VSDs more than 14 millimeters, and certainly not those which are kissing the aortic valve. In the era of asymmetric uh, amplards or perimembranous VSD occluder, the separation had to be more than two millimeters, Whereas in the current era where we use ADO1 and ADO2, the separation has to be even greater, three millimeters or more. This is what one should avoid in order to uh, prevent the complication of heart block. Down syndrome, pre-existing ECG abnormalities, extension of the VSD into the inlet, significant aortic valve prolapse, and of course, if there is a presence of aortic regurgitation. As you know, we have a, a whole lot of gamut of devices available to close perimembranous VSDs, but our device selection should be appropriate based on the size of the defect, presence of tricuspid valve aneurysm, distance separating the defect from the aortic valve, whether or not device extends into the, whether or not defect extends into the inlet, and presence and severity of pulmonary hypertension. Now let me talk about complications. Despite taking all the precautions what are the complications that one may encounter? Broadly speaking, these complications can be divided into acute and subacute or chronic. Acute complications are those which occur on table or in hospital before discharge, whereas subacute or chronic complications are those which occur after discharge, may occur over days, months, and sometimes even over years. Now, acute complications, I'm going to divide broadly into two, and I'm going to only focus on the first group of complications which are unique to perimembranous VSD uh, closure. They include device embolization. I'm aware that device can embolize in any part, but I think each device embolization is unique in the way that it, the site of uh, embolization is different and the management strategies are also quite different. The second is conduction disturbances. The third is tricuspid valve issues and last but not the least is aortic regurgitation. And these are some of the, uh, some of the complications which are common uh, with other interventions as well, like air embolism, thromboembolism, vascular complications, pericardial effusion, and last but not the least, very rarely death. Now these are some of the subacute or chronic complications which are associated with perimembranous VSD closure, the tricuspid valve complications, the aortic valve issues, the conduction, conduction system issues, occasionally delayed thromboembolism, and very, very rarely delayed device embolization. Let me begin with device embolization. This can occur with any type of device. The commonest cause is undersizing the defect. Unfortunately, there is no gold standard to size perimembranous VSDs, some groups go by echo, some groups go by angiograms, some groups look at the left ventricular aspect of the defect, the others by the right ventricular aspect, and depending upon what device you are going to use, they decide the diameter, either the same diameter, add one or add two, and then decide what size of device they are going to use. The problem is that these defects are not geometrical defects, like a circle or an oval. They have a geographical configuration. And in which plane you will cut the defect will decide what the size of the defect is going to be. So I believe that none of us really know the whole truth when it comes to sizing perimembranous VSD. And to make the things even worse, the surrounding tissues have variable stretch. And that is why you can grossly underestimate the defect. The site of embolization is usually on the pulmonary side, but in the era of asymmetric amplards or perimembranous VSD occluder, many devices also embolized on the systemic side because of a very thin waste 
and inability of the people to really realize that both the ways, uh, both the discs were on the left ventricular side. As was said by Jay, retrieval can be done in the cath lab or in the operating room. And these are some of the principles, very similar to what ASD retrieval is, informing and counseling the family, informing the OR and the surgeon, adequately heparinizing the patient, using a sheath which is much larger than what is used for uh, deploying the device, grabbing the screw either with a snare or bioptome. Best places are either the great arteries or the atria. Avoid trying to grab the device in the ventricles because of the fear of grabbing the subvalvar apparatus. As was said, and I would like to emphasize, never drag the unsheathed device across the valve because there's a good chance that you will traumatize the valve. And always, and always have a finite time frame. Don't keep on doing it hours after hours because there are chances that you will cause iatrogenic complications. I think prevention is the best strategy by selecting appropriate patient, appropriate device, as I had, as I had emphasized earlier, and of course executing the technique to the best uh, possible perfection. You must confirm before releasing that the left ventricular disc is on the LV side and the right ventricular disc is on the RV side and use all possible modalities, made be TE, TTE, or angiography. And not a bad idea to do a gentle Minnesota wiggle before you deploy the device. Let me talk about conduction disturbances. Uh, they are basically divided into three. You can either have a tachycardia during the procedure, a bradycardia, or normal heart rate with a conduction disturbance. The commonest tachycardia that you encounter, unlike for ASD closure, is not atrial, but ventricular tachycardia, and most often because of your wire or catheter manipulations in the right ventricle. Bradycardia can occur uh, because of complete heart block, whether you're crossing the VSD antigradely or retrogradely, and some groups believe that if there is a complete heart block occurring, probably something is wrong with the conduction system, and it is best not to go ahead and close the VSD, but that's not the view shared by all the groups. And of course, there are more benign conduction disturbances, like a right bundle or a left bundle branch block, or sometimes a left anterior hemi block. And this is an example, we started with normal, during the procedure you get right bundle branch block, at the end of the procedure it's not completely normalized, but maybe an incomplete right bundle branch block. Another case, you start with a baseline which is more or less normal for that age, and you can see during the procedure you develop a left anterior hemi block. And this is not at all uncommon, but these are not the cases wherein we would give up for the fear of complete heart block. Treatment, as far as tachycardia is concerned, usually they are self-terminating if you remove the wire or the catheter, but if it is sustained and if there is a hemodynamic compromise, you have very little option but to go ahead and cardioverb the patient. When it comes to bradycardia, more often than not, it is self-terminating again, even if it's a complete heart block, but if it is sustained, I think you need to use IV atropine, IV steroids, and very rarely pacing. Prevention is the best solution. So first and foremost is be gentle when you are manipulating your wire and your catheter in the ventricles or close to the VSD, that is close to the AV node. If there is a, a conduction disturbance, the first reaction is not to push, but to pull back the wire and the catheter, especially if you have entangled yourself in the subvalvar apparatus of the right ventricle, or if you are manipulating your catheter near the right ventricular outflow tract. So it's very important. These are the two areas which are highly sensitive to produce ventricular arrhythmias. Talking about tricuspid valve issues during the procedure, they occur most of the times when you are forming the arteriovenous loop. Regurgitation is much more common when you pull on the cordae. Occasionally, and I have seen one case where you can actually stitch the superior and the septal leaflet of the tricuspid valve. And in this baby, what actually happened was the right atrial pressure increased so disproportionately that it opened up the foramen ovale and the shunt was from right to left and patient desaturated. We really panicked. We didn't know what was the cause of desaturation. We looked at everything. And then we realized when we looked at the TEE that probably we had stitched the tricuspid valve and the PFO was shunting right to left. So the best thing is as and when this occurs, I think uh, you should be uh, very, very careful and you should not hesitate in undoing the loop. And this is an example. This is what I mean by not a good loop. When you get a knot like this, be very careful. Don't pull any further. You please remove the catheter, remove the wire, and recross the VST. If you try to pull this wire, rest assured that you will rupture the cord. And this is what I mean by a smooth loop. You have a very straight arteriovenous loop. This is a good loop to have. Treatment, as I said earlier, 
if there is sketch or if there is tricuspid regurgitation, the only way to go about is by undoing the loop. Prevention. So there are some tips in order that you're not through the caudal structure. So try and get into the pulmonary artery with the shortest possible loop. Don't go into the apex and then take the wire because there are chances that you may go through a cordae. When you want to retrieve the wire from the pulmonary artery, when you go from the venous side, try and use a balloon a flotation catheter rather than a right coronary catheter because the chances of a balloon flotation going through the corda is much less. And as I showed you earlier, try and make a straight loop and don't accept any angulated loops. Talking about aortic regurgitation, basically there are two mechanisms. One is trauma to the aortic valve while dropping the device from the ascending aorta. And second is at the time of deployment if you pinch the aortic cusp with the device. If you are dropping uh, the device from the ascending aorta and if you traumatize the aortic valve, there is very little that can be done. And more often than not, these patients will go for surgical repair if the aortic regurgitation is significant. If you have pinched the cusp at the time of deployment of the left ventricular disc, I think the best strategy is to retrieve the device, change the type of the device, change the size of the device, and see whether it makes any difference. And of course, the best course is to prevent. Be very gentle while dropping the device from the ascending aorta into the left ventricle. There is no way you can pull the device. Let the device fall by itself into the left ventricle. The best option is to deliver from the left ventricle rather than delivering from the aorta, but it may not be always possible. And in order to prevent the cusp getting pinched, I think you need to use the correct device. No talk on VSD complication will be complete without CHB because this is what really caused the panic in the world of interventions with the use of asymmetric amplatzer septal occluder. In the early studies, the incidence was reported to be pretty low, excepting one series from uh, Canada by Miro et al. However, beyond 2005, the incidence went on a rise and as much as 20% uh, was reported by Toronto group. And this is what made us uh, think or explore the possibility of using other devices. And in the end, I will just share a couple of cases with you to show you what complications we have gone through. This is a nine-year-old girl, nearly asymptomatic, near normal heart size, and maybe marginally increased vascularity. This is a case where a wrong patient selection was done. More than mild aortic regurgitation, there is a prolapse with a deformity of the cusp, but we thought that we may be able to just uh, get it done. So, so we took the patient in the cath lab. There is a ventricular septal defect. You can see the LV is quite voluminous, but in the aortic root, you can see that there is some deformity of the right coronary cusp. We got the device in place, and there was no further worsening. These are, these are the days of asymmetric amplatzer septal occluder. We were pretty happy, really. And then we released, and there is a little bit of foaming there. And six hours after the procedure, no event but the fellow recorded that there was a systolic murmur and echo confirmed the worst fear. And you can see this device into the left pulmonary artery. So again, the issues, what size device, the, the screw was looking on the other side laterally. So how to rotate the device, how to hold the screw. And if you are not able to screw, uh, hold the screw, then what is the next strategy? So this is how the device looks. So the first thing is that we anticoagulated, the flow was quite good. So all the tricks were used to turn the screw medially. So we tried it with the help of a snare, and you can see this with this snare. We are able to get the screw medially. You see this? And then we got the other snare so as to hold the screw, and we didn't want to give up this position of uh, screw facing the medial aspect. So we are able to grab, but this screw is a little bit buried. So we are not able to grab the screw, but a part of the device. And then we partly got it into the sheath, not completely, but we had no option. So partly grab device is brought into the sheath, brought into the groin, but we were not able to get it beyond. So we asked the surgical colleagues to help us and we got it out with a scar, which wasn't looking too good acutely, but over a period of time, the scar was not too bad. So this was one disaster. Now that was acute disaster. This is even worse. This is a patient who is a seven year old who underwent uh, closure of VSD. No problems on table, no problems, 24 hours follow up. And see the disaster. Look at the tricuspid valve. It's completely torn. And even worse, you can see this. 
both the anterior as well as the septal leaflet, very severe tricuspid regurgitation. Fortunately, this was fixed very well by our surgical colleagues. And see this, and see this, he comes back with maybe a trivial to mild tricuspid regurgitation. So uh, a, a rather simple problem of perimembranous VSD, which wasn't too large, was converted into a, a rather complex problem. And similarly, this is aortic valve. And this is what I mean. When this disc touches or pinches the right coronary cusp, I think we have no business. Unfortunately, this patient also did not have any aortic regurgitation on table. No regurgitation at six weeks follow-up. It is only at six months that she, develops follow -up, uh, that she develops aortic regurgitation. But I think this should have been anticipated, which we did not. And this is more than mild aortic regurgitation. And despite our repeated coaxing, the family refuses to undergo uh, the procedure. And this is the last case that I'm going to show. This is a case, again, asymptomatic patient. The first case I showed of embolization, wrong patient choice. This is wrong device choice. You see this. This is a tunnel within the muscular septum. This is the left ventricular disc of a muscular VSD device. This has been brought in contact with the left ventricular aspect, and then you release the waste and the right ventricular disc. And it is not at all uncommon that when the device is on the cable, the right ventricular disc does not form itself all that well. Again, a check angiogram was made, no residual shunt, and so the operator thought, hoping against hope, that the right ventricular disc will form itself. Unfortunately, even after the release, the right ventricular disc doesn't form itself. And here again, an angiogram shows that the device is sitting beautifully, but I'm not too sure whether the right ventricular disc is completely into the right ventricle or it is still in the interventricular septum. 15 minutes down the line, no problems, but 20 minutes down the line, it is milked into the left ventricle. So this is what I mean, that if you choose a wrong device or if you choose a wrong patient, there, are, there is a good likelihood that you may get into problems. And this is how I would like to conclude that success has many fathers. Failure is an orphan. Many times when you get into complications, you tend to blame the patient variables, you tend to talk about the VSD characteristics, and you tend to blame the device for its behavior. More often than not, in our experience, it's a human error, and that's why all this is operator-related and therefore highly preventable. Thank you for your patient hearing, ladies and gentlemen.